So today we are going into the second tutorial on the control systems tutorials that Kushal put together. And this is going to be probably the most mathematically intensive tutorial that we have in this series. And in the video here, I'm going to try and keep it fairly high level, but you will definitely want to go and check out the written tutorial that Kushal put together because he does a lot of the derivations and he shows how we get from one uh, equation to the end equation, and he goes into more detail. I'm not planning on going into rotational bodies and the mechanical examples, things like that. So I highly recommend going to circuitbread.com and looking this up there and seeing the wonderful tutorial that Kushal put together. But before we get into this tutorial on mathematical modeling of control systems, I just want to say that besides being more mathematically intensive, it also is going to assume that you've taken at least uh, the equivalent of like second semester uh, circuits with AC or sinus sinusoidal circuits, because we're going to be dealing with um, capacitors and inductors in both the time domain and in the Laplace domain. And it's not absolutely necessary that you have that experience, but it is going to be helpful. Okay, so one of the first things that we need to do is we need to first just say all of the things that we're talking about right now are going to be linear time invariant systems or LTI systems. So if you've taken a control system class or anything like that, or excuse me, not controls, but uh, signals, signals and Signals and systems. Yeah, signals and systems class. Yeah, if you've taken anything like that, you probably are already aware of what an LTI system is. And if you haven't, I just want to go over that really quick. And that is basically where if you have x of t and it goes into some sort of box, we'll call that box, and you get y of t out, this sort of system, because it doesn't matter if I'm doing it right now, if I'm doing it in 10 years or five years ago or whatever, it means that you can do certain things. Like you can say a x of t, a times x of t going into that same box comes out is a y of t. And same thing if you have x one of t plus x two of t going into this box. Oh man, why am I putting box in sometimes and not other times? Then your output is going to be um, y1 of t plus y2 of t. So having an LTI system when you're dealing with this sort of stuff just really simplifies things, which is important because this is actually a pretty mathematically intensive portion of control systems, and it's very, very easy to get lost in it, and I don't want you to do that. So first, just remember, this is some of the properties of an LTI system. Second, we're going to keep things at a high level. And third, once you do go over and check out Kushal's written tutorials, just relax, take your time. And if there's something you're like, wait, how did it get from here to here? He, he said it in there. Just go back and make sure you read it again and take your time and it'll all become clear to you. So let's talk about how we can mathematically model a, can, a control system. And one of the simplest ways we're going to do this is a basic circuit that we've seen a lot, and that's just you have your voltage source and then your resistor, R, L, whoa, that L, sorry, and then C. So it is a series RLC circuit. So you have your V sub T and your V C of T here, and this is a very stereotypical and very simple control system in that you give it an input voltage, and by controlling your resistance, your inductance, and your capacitance, you get an output voltage. And that is the essence of it. And, and okay, so you're looking at this, this is great, but how do you create something out of that mathematically? Now, this is something where you just know Kirchhoff's voltage laws and everything, so that's not going to be a problem. And I'm just going to write down that equation right here, and I'm going to copy it so I don't mess it up. So here we have this equation, which describes this um, you know, assuming that this is R and that this is L, this describes this. However, you really want to take this equation and make it input, uh, make it so you have the output on one side and the input on the other side, or else this doesn't really do you that much good. So we can take a couple of steps. And, and again, I don't want to get into the math here too much because I want to keep it high level. But let's just say from this basic equation that we got from Kirchhoff's laws, we can come up with a, an equation that more explicitly relates the input voltage to the output voltage. Okay, so now you can see that we took the original equation that we got off of Kirchhoff's law and then made a, uh, another version where instead of having the I of t that doesn't really relate the input voltage and the output voltage, we made those replacements so we have everything in terms of V sub t, which is the output voltage, 
compared to v of v v c v c of t compared to v sub t. So we have the input voltage here, and we have the output voltage there. So uh, I, I did obviously skip some mathematical steps here, but when you are mathematically modeling a control system on the circuit side, this is all you're doing, is you are solving it for Kirchhoff's law, and then you are getting the input and relating it to the output. And so I want to emphasize that that is it. Do not get lost in the math. That is the main goal of all of this, is making it so that mathematically you are saying the output voltage, in this case that's what we care about, it could be something else, but in this case the output voltage is related to the input voltage in this way. So if we were to take this equation and we were to physically make this circuit right here and we were to plug in values for our capacitance and our inductance and all of that sort of stuff, what we put in and what we get out should match this mathematically. Now the problem is, as you look at this, you're like, oh wow, this is really cool, but when, let's say V sub T equals, uh, I don't know, sine, sine 3T or whatever, and you, and you look at that and you're like, wait, how do I actually use this? What? This is fantastic and, and it's cool to see math and having the ability to actually match that with physical, tangible results. But really, this is just one step. So right now, we're doing the mathematical modeling. In the next tutorial, we're going to be creating transfer functions and other systems where we use this information and take it and make it into something that actually is usable so that you can say, hey, I have this input. What is my expected output going to be? Because right now, this is showing the relationship, but it's not really in a format that you could actually do that and say, well, here's my input. What's my output? It'd be Oh, crud, I still got all of these different outputs and, it, outputs, and it gets really quite complicated. So I just want to, one, say, again, don't get lost in the math. This is all we're doing, is we're trying to create a mathematical model for this. And don't freak out about the fact that right now, this isn't really that usable. So one of the things is, and it's pretty weird how this is, is on the control system sides, there's a lot of comparisons between the electrical and the mechanical systems that they have out there. And so I'm going to put together a quick mechanical system, even though that is far from my specialty, and try and show the relationship between the electrical and the mechanical. And hopefully that will make you have a more intuitive understanding of what's going on. Because the mechanical, it's easier to visualize because we can play with springs, we can play with weights, and we know how it's going to react. Whereas with the electrical, uh, usually when you're starting out, it's not quite as intuitive. So let me grab another piece of paper and we'll do a quick mechanical sample and then I'll show you the relationships. Okay, so on the mechanical side, usually we'll just say this is a ceiling. I'm stealing this straight from Kushal's written tutorial. And then instead of this being an inductor, that's actually a spring. And then we, we've got what's called a damper here. And then this is all connected to a weight or a mass. So I think the spring is K, the damper is B, yes, B, and then your mass, and then you have a force going down here, F of T, and then you have the change in distance, which is your X of T. Now, in this case, since we have a mechanical system here, we have the a ceiling, which has a spring hanging from it, and then a damper, which is kind of like your shocks in a uh, in a car. It's something that no matter what, it's resisting being pushed in and it's resisting being pulled out. So that's why if you just had springs on your car instead of springs and shocks, every time you hit a bump, you'd just be bouncing and bouncing and bouncing. So it's a mixture between having the springs that'll make it so you'll bounce a little bit and then properly balance. Those shocks will absorb that energy so you kind of just bounce and then you come back if it's perfect, but usually it bounces a little bit. Anyway, so this B represents those sorts of shocks that you would have on your car. And then again, your springs and your mass and the relationship that you can find here is by how much force you pull on the uh, you pull on that mass will also tell you how much you deviate from your baseline, basically where you normally just sit. So using this example, we can actually now create a, a, a table that will show us how this spring, this damper, this mass, the force, and the displacement is equivalent to our electrical example. Uh, and again, I am skipping over the rotational portion, but you can also have this same basic idea, and instead of a spring being sprung this way, a spring that you're kind of tightening up that then wants to spin back. So we have our mechanical, translational, 
movement, and then we have our electrical equivalence. So for here, the force that is being put onto the system in the first place is actually the voltage that you would have on, on the electrical side. And then the mass is going to be the inductance, because as we know, the uh, inductors don't like to change the amount of current going through them, and they'll generate voltages based on your attempts at changing that current. Then we have the damping coefficient, um, which just is equivalent to the, resi the resistor, because again, with a resistor, it's going to resist uh, current going one way or the other way, so most, most of these are quite intuitive and um, just help us have a better understanding of what's going on. And then we have the spring stiffness, which is the reciprocal of the capacitance. So with a spring, when you stretch it out, you're storing energy in it, just like you would with a capacitor. And then when you release it, just like with a capacitor, if you charge it up and then take your voltage away, if it has a place to discharge, it will discharge, and that's kind of the snapping back action of it. So I would like to just go through, I should have been doing this before, mass, and then uh, damping. And then this is spring, spring stiffness. And then finally we have the displacement, which is the X. And in our case, that's going to be the charge that we have on, on our output, on our um, capacitor, how much of a charge there is in there at that time. So displacement doesn't have any time factor, it's here just like charge in a capacitor doesn't have any time, doesn't have any time factor. And then finally, we have velocity. Oops, uh, why, am, why did I change that? Which is just basically dx dt. And then you get the same thing over here, which is current, which is the change in your charge. So you can see how when you are looking at a mechanical sample or a mechanical system, it has quite a bit in common with an electrical system. And so when you actually take this system and create the equation to describe it, it looks incredibly similar to the same equation that we have here to describe this RLC series system. Now the interesting thing is I am using, I, I'm showing you the relationship between the RLC series and the mechanical system and showing that here. But actually, if we were to take this and make this into an RLC parallel, where you have um, V of T and then you have the resistor, have the inductor, and then the capacitor all in parallel, obviously the equations are going to be different for this. And as the equations are different for this, those comparisons here are actually going to be different as well. And again, there's a lot of nitty gritty details, and this is going to be probably the most complicated tutorial that we have on this entire control systems topic. So I highly recommend you go in and you take your time to become more comfortable. You don't have to know it perfectly, but read what Kushal has and make sure you're comfortable with it before moving on to the next one, because this is pretty fundamental, pretty foundational for everything that we're going to be covering in the rest of this series, both in the first chapter and in the second chapter of these control systems. So the interesting thing is, even though I'm showing you the electrical and the mechanical and showing how they can be uh, mathematically kind of similar in the way you treat uh, them and the way you think about them, when you actually have an electromechanical system like a motor, you can actually have a an input, which is a voltage, and an output, which is a rotational displacement. So you can literally mathematically have a relationship between an electrical and a mechanical system. And it's really quite cool. And again, very mathematically intensive with a lot of stuff going on. And Kushal, again, shows the derivation there. And I really hate the way, I, I almost feel like this is a, oh, just go read the tutorial, just go read the tutorial. But frankly, that's really what I'm recommending here. This is a lot of math and we don't want these videos to be incredibly long, and I just wanted to give you an overview so that if you are going through what Kushal has and you start to get lost, remember, just come back, maybe watch this again, and remember the, the high-level stuff, and that is basically you're just trying to describe a physical, uh, a very real physical system 
mathematically, and that is all we are trying to do right here. So if you start to get lost and you start to say, hey, what's going on here? Pull yourself back, look at it again, and make sure you don't lose sight of that. Okay, I hope that didn't scare you. I hope that was more encouraging rather than, oh my gosh, I don't want to get into this ever again. Um, please, I, please, please go check that out. There's so much information. I, I would recommend planning at least an hour, at least an hour going over that and then maybe a day later going back and spending 15 minutes again to review and making sure that all those things really stuck in your head. And um, if this was helpful, please let us know. Uh, we, we love all of our subscribers, so please subscribe, give us a like, all that sort of stuff. As it is, I hope you're as excited about this whole control system series as I am, and we will catch you in the next one.